Welcome, my name is Joe Betts, and today I'm gonna to be talking about cloud provider integrations um, with Kubernetes and the extensibility features um, around that. A uh, couple of things about myself. Um, so I'm a etcd maintainer. I've been working at Google. I've been involved in Kubernetes for about four years. Um, I'm mostly involved in API machinery. Um, I've contributed to bringing custom resource definitions to GA, bringing admission webhooks to GA, and more recently, um, developing the server-side apply feature, um, which is um, slated to go to GA in the upcoming 1.22 release. Um, more recently, I've gotten involved in SIG Cloud Provider, and I'm gonna be talking about that quite a bit today. Uh, I've got a lot to cover. I'm start, gonna start by talking um, a little bit about the Cloud Provider Extraction Project, which is a fairly large initiative in the Kubernetes community. Um, I'm then gonna switch gears and focus on Kubernetes extensibility features in general, and then start to kind of work our way down to the more Cloud Provider specific extensibility features. Um, from there, um, we'll dig into how those features can be used to build Cloud Provider integrations, and um, help move the Cloud Provider Extraction Project forward. Um, I'll then finish up by talking a little bit about how this makes Kubernetes um, better, both for the Kubernetes developers and for the ecosystem at large. So let's get started. Um, let's start by talking about the Cloud Provider Extraction Project. This is a project that's led by SIG Cloud Provider, um, and it really comes from their core mission statement, which includes um, the goal of evolving the Kubernetes ecosystem in a way that is neutral to all cloud providers. Um, to get a sense of what that means, let's have a look at the code. So on the left here, we have a list of the cloud providers that are in the main Kubernetes source tree. These cloud providers are um, uh, uh, directly compile, compiled into the main Kubernetes um, binaries. Um, and are deeply integrated with the Kubernetes code base. On the right, we have the out-of-tree cloud providers. These are cloud providers that are exist in their own separate source repos, um, are built out of their own binaries, and only interact with the main Kubernetes binaries through extension points. You might have already noticed that there's some overlap, like some of these um, cloud providers are in both, right? In tree and out of tree. And there's a reason for this. There's um, currently a, a migration going on to move all in tree cloud providers out of tree. Um, so um, these are the source and destinations of that migration. Um, when this migration completes, um, we will be able to delete all of this code out of the main Kubernetes code base. Uh, I haven't listed all of the Kubernetes cloud provider implementations here. There are many, many other third-party cloud provider implementations that are that are um, really well built. Um, I have just kind of limited my list here to the ones that exist in the Kubernetes community-owned source repositories. Um, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of this. So. Uh, one benefit's kind of obvious, like we're gonna delete a lot of code out of Kubernetes and that's gonna result in a, you know, a more stable and maintainable um, core. Um, a lot of that deletion is actually gonna be dependencies. Um, the cloud provider implementations pull in a lot of complex dependencies and we're gonna be able to take all of that out of Kubernetes. Um, that's gonna result, of course, in um, easier development, but it's also going to result in nice things like, like smaller binaries. Of course, this also helps us achieve that goal of having like a cloud provider neutral ecosystem. Um, and it does it in a nice way because what we're doing is we're up leveling the extensibility of Kubernetes so that anything that the entry cloud providers can do today will be available to all cloud providers. Lastly, this is a big benefit for developers in general. If you are developing cloud provider integrations, you're gonna be doing that in your own source um, repository. You're gonna have your own release process with your own cadence. Um, you're not gonna be locked into the main Kubernetes release process, which is fairly infrequent. Um, and we're seeing the benefits of, of this 
um, happening, right? We are seeing increased activity in extensibility point development. We're seeing increased activity around cloud controller um, manager infrastructure, right? The ability to um, build a cloud controller is getting easier because um, we're up leveling that as part of the migration and all third party cloud providers will benefit from that infrastructure as well. I'll talk about that more as we kind of get towards the end of the talk. Um, this project has been going on for over two years in open source. Um, just recently, we hit one key milestone, which is in the 1.21 release, a moratorium was placed that restricts any feature development from happening in tree. Um, that's a pretty strong incentive for um, um, these migrations to get completed. And then in the 1.24 release, which should be roughly a year from now, um, all of the entry cloud provider code is slated to be deleted, um, which kind of brings this whole uh, migration kind of to a close. Um, I'm going to switch topics now. We're going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes extensibility. Um, just to kind of warm up, we're going to talk about some of the core extensibility features of Kubernetes. Um, we'll dive into some more advanced ones, and then we're really going to get down into the kind of cloud provider specific capabilities um, that are available. We're going to talk a lot about things that you would only really see if you were a vendor or cloud provider um, adding functionality to Kubernetes. So let's get started. Um, this almost goes without saying, but Kubernetes. Controllers really are the original Kubernetes extensibility feature. Um, the, the idea in Kubernetes that you have this central component in your control plane that doesn't actually have any logic in it, and all of the logic is pushed out into processes that communicate to it via a common API, that's a very Kubernetes-specific idea. Um, and it's really shaped the Kubernetes API. The Kubernetes API is a full API. If you can use that API, you can do anything that can be done in Kubernetes because everything that we do in Kubernetes is done through it, right? Even things like scheduling of pods and garbage collection, those are all done through the API. This means it's a really powerful extension point. If you write your own controller, you can do pretty much anything that can be done. Um, and it's um, the way that you set up controllers is, is um, really well thought out too, right? You can run a controller right there in the cluster. You can just tell Kubernetes to run your controller and you just provide it with the container image and we'll start it up for you and manage it. Um, you can also choose to run it in the control plane if you want to manage it that way. There's a lot of flexibility. Um, the, kind of the complement to controllers in some ways is res custom resource definitions. Um, I really like that phrase that I hear a lot, which is that Kubernetes is all about the API. Um, it's a really powerful, complete API, and the idea that you can take and add more first-class objects to it is really powerful, and that's what CRDs allow you to do. And when you take and combine a CRD with a controller, you get things like the operator um, pattern, right? And that's a huge part of what the Kubernetes ecosystem is, that you can customize Kubernetes to do almost anything. And let's look at the mechanism you use. So for a custom resource definition, what you do is you add an object to the API um, that says what your new um, resource type is going to be, right? And you, you specify the format of it and how it works, and then you can just start creating those objects. We're going to see these kind of patterns as we dig deeper into extensibility um, features of Kubernetes. So let's let's go a layer deeper. Um, admission webhooks. Um, so dynamic admission control is kind of the idea that you can intercept a request coming to the API server, and you could do whatever you want. You could reject it. You could modify it. Um, things like that. Um, pretty powerful concept. Um, lots of different applications to it. You can add security checks. Um, you could add additional validation to a CRD. Um, you could make it so that every time a certain kind of pod is created, there's some sidecar that's ad added to it. There's a lot of different things you could do with this. But it's more advanced, and there's more sharp edges around it, right? Each webhook is part of that critical serving path of a request that gets to the API server. With that comes a lot of responsibility, right? If, that, if your webhook fails, what's going to happen? You have to choose. If you choose to have your webhook fail open, you're saying that if my webhook 
um, if the process I'm serving my webhooks from can't be reached by the API server, then we should just accept the request in, which means my webhook wasn't run. If I fail close, then what I'm telling the API server is that I, if my webhook process can't be reached, that the whole request should fail. Well, that's good in terms of like security. We're not introducing a security hole, but we are potentially causing the entire control plane to go unavailable if my webhook becomes unavailable. Um, so there's a lot of responsibility there in webhook development. Also, webhooks are part of that critical serving path, and so their latency really matters. Um, if you add a bunch of mutating webhooks that are slow, you're going to add a lot of latency. In fact, you can reach a point where the Kube API server will time out webhook, um, its, its webhook handling requests, and then it will fail. Um, so you have, to, you have to keep your webhooks fast. Um, adding a webhook is, is a relatively well-defined process, and it's kind of like adding a controller, right? You can just run it in the cluster um, using existing Kubernetes constructs, and then just um, register with the Kube API server where it is, and it will talk to it. And that's really easy to do too, right? You just add a Kubernetes object talk that explains your webhook, and you're all set. So this kind of you're kind of seeing some patterns here, right? Running running binaries as dedicated processes, and then configuring um, how you communicate with them as a way of doing extensions. Um, the next extension I wanted to talk about is a little less commonly seen, and it's called the aggregation API server um, pattern. Um, so what you do here is you tell the API server that for some API endpoints, um, like for some URL path. Um, don't actually serve it from the API server, but instead forward the request to some other system. And you get to decide where that system is, and it, you can control exactly how it works. You can have it still act as though it is an API server and have it use um, you know, um, Kubernetes object formats, or you could have it do something completely different. It's entirely up to you. It's a really powerful extension point. Um, and, uh, uh, can do a lot of different things. Um, the way you use it again, fairly similar, right? You can just um, run run your process either in in cluster or in the control plane, and then you um, configure the API server to tell it where um, where your um, extension server is. The next couple um, extension points we're going to talk about are a little more low level. So typically, you would be a vendor or a cloud provider developer um, that is adding your system to Kubernetes. Um, the first one is the container storage interface. Um, so this allows you to extend Kubernetes to support a uh, vendor or cloud provider specific volume implementation. Um, and the way that this one works is that you need um, to add something called the device plugin binary to every node. And then the kubelet's going to talk to that. Well, one way you could do that is through a daemon set. You could use a daemon set, and you will get um, a container running on every node, and this works just fine. Um, so you could deploy your um, your um, volume support onto the cluster that way. And then what the way that this extension point works is that your device plugin, when it starts, it's going to register itself um, with the kubelet by sending a request to a socket at a well-defined location. And then once that happens, it's going to tell the kubelet where its socket is, and the kubelet is going to then start making requests to it for container-related operations, or sorry, um, volume-related operations um, on its socket. Um, and so now you have a communication flow, and um, everything everything's all hooked together. Um, the container network interface, or CNI, um, is somewhat um, similar. Um, here again, we're doing we're adding a process to the node. Um, this one, though, um, you have to configure at kubelet startup. So you provide flags to the kubelet telling it that it's going to be using CNI and where the config for that is and where the binary is. And then what happens is when the kubelet needs to set up some networking, it's going to exec this binary as a sub-process and then communicate through it via standard in and standard out. Um, this works pretty well because typically um, you don't need to run this process for very long. 
like it might configure some IP tables and then shut down and you're done. Um, and so it's it tends not to be um, running very often. And so kind of executing as a sub process is, ends up being fairly, um, fairly low cost. Um, the, the last of these, um, these container interfaces is the container runtime interface. Um, this was introduced back when um, Docker was still the only way that Kubernetes could run containers. Um, and it, it was introduced as a way of allowing um, alternate container runtimes. Um, this one, the way it works is you provide flags to the kubelet on startup, um, telling it what sockets to communicate to for um, container runtime and for image service management. And what the kubelet then does um, uh, is just send requests to those sockets. Um, it's expecting that service to be running when the kubelet's running. Um, so you cannot run this service with a daemon set. You really do need to um, set this up the same way that the kubelet is set up, right? Um, part of the problem here is if you try to use a daemon set, well, what a daemon set's gonna do is it's gonna pull an image to run a process, and then it's going to start that container. Um, well, what you're trying to set up here is the infrastructure to pull images and run containers. So that's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. So typically here, you know, if, if you are, um, if you provision a node by using system D to start the kubelet, you would probably also use system D to start um, that CRI service that you need. Uh, so now let's talk about some of the new extensibility features um, that are available. Um, we're going to talk about kind of three different areas. We're going to talk about networking between the control plane and the cluster. We're going to talk about container image credentials. And we're also going to talk about the more general problem of how do you run cloud-specific controllers. So first, um, networking. So one limitation with Kubernetes is that it is not secure to run the control plane and have it communicate to a cluster across an untrusted network. Um, that, is, that is not something that is securely supported by Kubernetes. And um, it's generally problematic because like, you're going to have to somehow what open ports to every node in your cluster on an untrusted network um, so that the control plane can communicate to it. Um, even just managing those firewall rules would be a real, a real nightmare. Um, so what um, this extension feature is, it's called the API in server egress, is the way that you can have the API server talk to a proxy, which then is responsible for talking to your cluster. And so you can basically introduce a, you know, a single communication channel from your control plane to a cluster, and then you can go ahead and secure that as you need. Um, and I'll talk about um, like a, a, a de facto implementation of this, it's pretty good. Um, and the way that that extension feature works is that when you start the Kube API server, you provide a configuration file. And that configuration file is a Kubernetes object that says what the redirect rules are. Um, so you can both redirect traffic to the cluster so that the control plane can talk to all the nodes. You can also redirect traffic to other components of the master. Um, so for example, the Kube API server needs to talk to etcd. You can proxy that communication as well. Um, there is a pretty good implementation of this extension point called the connectivity server. It uses um, MTLS over TCP for everything. Um, so it's a pretty standard. It's easy to um, set up a single firewall rule. You get that one connection. It's bi-directional. So it, you're both your control plane talking to your nodes and your nodes talking back to your control plane all can go through that same system. Um, and um, all everything's, everything's along that whole communication chain. Um, you have MTLS and you know um, um, side inserts all the way across. For um, container image credentials, this is an interesting problem. So when you, if you're building a cloud provider, um, typically your your developers might have a container registry which might be private, right? So for example, if you're running um, uh, you might have an account in a cloud provider. As part of that account, you have your own container registry, which is private to you, and you can upload images to it and do everything you want to do. Um, it would. You also need the credentials to that container registry to pull the images onto your nodes. 
Um, so to have a really nice turnkey cloud provider implementation of Kubernetes, that should probably all be integrated together. And that's what this extension point allows you to do. You can tell the kubelet um, where it can load credential providers from, and then you can provide a binary that does whatever you need. This uses that exec subprocess um, pattern again, where um, the kubelet, whenever it needs credentials, it's going to start a subprocess and then talk to it through standard in and standard out. When it's done, it will shut it down. It's not that frequent. It's going to need two new credentials. So um, this works out pretty well. Um, you configure it by telling it kind of a list of different images and where it looks up credentials for each of those. Um, and then once you've got this all set up, you should be good. Um, a good example of this is um, like, for example, in GCP, um, every um, every image, um, every VM has a metadata endpoint. And so what you what and so those can be loaded up with credentials, and then the credential provider can just grab the credentials from that metadata endpoint and provide it back to Kubernetes. Um, in a different environment, you might get credentials from somewhere else. There might be some um, service that you load them from or some other way of looking them up. Um, you can do any of those with this extension point. Um, finally, the last thing we're going to talk about is um, cloud provider specific controllers. So in the main Kubernetes code base, in the entry implementation, there's a bunch of controllers that do cloud provider specific stuff. That includes um, node related controllers. So um, creating new creating nodes and deleting nodes often means creating or deleting VMs. Um, it can involve volumes because there's a lot of like cloud specific storage systems involved. It can involve routes and services where load balancers are involved. Or lastly, it can involve like IP address management where like IP uh, ranges need to be allocated um, or provisioned for various things. All of those controllers um, in the entry implementation um, were activated when you set flags on the kube controller manager. You would say which, which cloud provider you were using, and then you would provide some additional config, and those the right set of controllers would be run. Um, in the out-of-tree architecture, the kube controller manager is not going to have anything cloud-specific in it. So when you run it, these controllers will not be run. Instead, um, you were going to, every cloud provider is going to have its own cloud controller manager um, that it provides as a separate binary. And when you start that, you'll provide a bunch of cloud um, provider specific flags, and it's going to be responsible for running those controllers. This is a pretty big change, right? Um, um, right now, if you're running any of those in tree cloud providers, you're only running one controller manager. By the end of this migration, there's going to be two controller managers running. Um, so in order to achieve that, there's been a couple things that's happened. Um, one is that um, there's been a bunch of improvements around controller management manager infrastructure. Um, this makes it easier to define and author new controller managers and wire in all the flags that you need. Um, and also very importantly, um, it's added HA support for migrating controllers. Um, so if you are running a Kubernetes cluster that is mission critical, um, you may be using a HA control plane, which means you're running multiple replicas of the of every component of the control plane, the API server, your scheduler, your, um, your controller manager, everything you're going to run um, probably like in triplicate. And um, if one of them goes down, your, your, your control plane is still up. Or if you need to do a rolling upgrade, you can upgrade the entire control plane without any downtime. Um, we need um, a way to do the cloud controller migration, moving those controllers, those cloud-specific controllers from the in-tree architecture to the out-of-tree architecture without any downtime. Um, this is a little tricky to do, and I'm not going to get into all the details, um, but it was a really interesting um, there's a really interesting solution um, that is um, being rolled out where um, we use multiple leader election leases um, and or locks, sorry, multiple leader election locks. So basically what happens is the Kube controller manager um, claims two locks, one for all cloud provider agnostic controllers and then another for the cloud provider specific controllers. Um, and then over time, what will happen is in the, the subsequent release, 
the cloud controller manager will be will start to be run and it will try and claim just the lease for the cloud specific controllers um, and then once the um, you release a version of the con cube controller manager that doesn't have cloud controllers in it anymore then only the cloud controller managers can be able to claim that lease and so you get this kind of series of operations that happen where you hand off ownership of those controllers from one system to another. But at any given point in time, you still have the same guarantees around controller management, which is only one controller is being run actively at any given point in time, but there are still backups that can take over if that one shuts down. Um, the last thing I'll mention about controllers is that if you are doing cloud um, provider development, um, something like Coop um, Builder is a really good option. Um, we're doing a lot of improvements around the core controller manager infrastructure, um, but um, a system like Coop Builder, if you are building a lot of new controllers, um, is a really good way to do that. Um, um, our team has quite a few engineers that work very closely with Coop Builder, and it's a really solid system. That's it. Um, the, the thing that I'll kind of end with for everyone here is that when we get to a point where we've really moved all of this kind of cloud specific and uh, code out of Kubernetes, we really have this cloudless Kubernetes core. Um, it has less code in it, less cloud specific stuff in it, but more extension points. It's a more versatile, more tightly knit system um, and I really think that is going to help with the longevity and health of the Kubernetes code base. Um, I think it's going to um, start to build an increasingly vibrant ecosystem. I'm really excited to see like what other extensibility points people find that are needed. Um, if you do find that you have a gap, please come talk to the cloud provider SIG. Um, we're very interested in hearing from you. To get involved, um, you can come to our Slack channel. Um, or our mailing list, and we meet regularly every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. There's a lot more details on the link here um, to our SIG page. Thank you, and I will open it for questions.